Hello, Wixen students. My name is Tyler Maycath from the Dennis Conservation Land Trust. I'm the Outreach and Stewardship Coordinator with the Land Trust. And uh, we are a nonprofit conservation land trust. We protect land around the town of Dennis for future generations to enjoy. And all of us right now as well. And we're sorry that we can't join you in person uh, to spend some time with you. But uh, we thought we would produce uh, some videos and provide some other educational materials for you um, during this time when we're all separated from each other. One of the great things you can do while you're spending time at home and in your neighborhood is you can learn more about birds. And in fact, there are birds all around us all the time. We're very fortunate to live on Cape Cod where there's lots of trees and shrubs and flowers and natural habitats where all our birds can nest and feed and raise their young and thrive. And uh, I've been outside here today and uh, for about an hour, I'm just observing and uh, there's a hummingbird right behind our filmer right now. Wow, maybe we can get a peek later. Um, so uh, yeah, we got we have some feeders up in my yard here, and uh, I've been watching the, uh, the the main feeder, which has sunflower seed in it. We also have a hummingbird feeder uh, behind us here. Uh, so those bring birds into your yard, um, but even if you don't have those feeders in your yard. Um, it's very easy to observe birds all around you all the time with your naked eye. You just have to be patient and sit quietly. So uh, we're going to talk about some common backyard, backyard birds today. And we're also going to talk about binoculars and spotting scope. Two tools that you can use to observe birds uh, that are around you. So uh, there are a wide variety of binoculars to choose from out there on the internet and maybe your parents can help you find the right pair for you. So these are um, Nikon. So these are pretty nice binoculars. And these are probably mid-range price binoculars, but they're still kind of expensive. Uh, there are very good binoculars that you can purchase for about $50 on the internet. Uh, so the price has come way down over time, which is great. Um, and it makes birding more accessible for beginners and um, kids as well. So what I want to do is just point out some pieces of the binoculars here. So um, two different eyepieces, of course, right here. And what you do to see through the binoculars is you place them right up to your eyes. If you wear glasses, you might be comfortable wearing your glasses. Uh, or you may not be very comfortable wearing your glasses. If you wear glasses, generally you want these eye cups uh, recessed like this. But if you don't wear eyeglasses, you can pull the eye cups out and it will actually help you look at birds better. Um, and when you focus, you'll set the diopter first, which is this ring here. And that accounts for the difference between your two eyes. So your eyes see differently and you want them to be in alignment when you're looking at birds. So set your diopter and then set your focus ring, which is in the middle here. And these are eight by 42 magnification. So they're very good for birding. And wow, look at this. Just in front of me here, two common species just came in. We have American robin and a chipping sparrow. Two very common birds um, that live all around us all the time. And they've flown away. Thank you, filmer. <laughs> uh, okay. So, another great tool that you can use as you get more advanced in birding is a spotting scope. And again, this is um, more of an advanced tool, but it's great for seeing birds from a distance, from great distances even. Uh, so the magnification on these can be up to 60 times. Compare that to my binoculars, which are eight time magnification. So um, I have a special tool on here right now. And wow, 
Look out there. There's a red-tailed hawk just flying over our neighbor's house. Pretty special. You spend a little time out here, you see all kinds of cool things. Very neat. I had an adapter on here for taking photos. Uh, so the thing about a spotting scope is it has much more powerful magnification, but it's used much in the same way as binoculars. Only you don't have a diopter, so you don't need to account for the difference between your two eyes. So you're going to use it which without, whichever eye you find to be dominant. And generally, it's whatever eye you see at a better. But you might find if you're a right-handed person, you look out at your right eye. You might find if you're a left-handed person, you look out at your left eye. It just depends. So uh, similarly on here, we have a focus knob here, okay? And then we have our zoom on the eyepiece, the ocular eyepiece here. This is the objective lens here, which is what you see out of. This is our lens cap to protect it when we're not using it. And this is our tripod. So these are two separate pieces of equipment. The tripod attaches to the spotting scope via the tripod head here, or the plate. Uh, so if you have a spotting scope, you need a tripod to steady it because it's very difficult to kind of use it in your hand. Binoculars are better for your hands. So when you want to look at a bird, you're going to zoom in and then set your focus. Okay? Great for looking at shorebirds on the beach or gulls or what your neighbor's doing in their yard. Just <laughs> kidding. Don't do that. So now that we've gone over our tools, we're going to talk a little bit about how you identify birds. So we're going to step inside for a minute here. And notice, look at all these cool field guides that I have accumulated over time. So, um, most popular field guide, especially for beginners, is the Sibley Field Guide to Birds of North America. And here we have we have the big version. This is a uh, this is not the current edition; it's an older edition. And then what I generally recommend is this right here. This is the Sibley Field Guide to Birds of Eastern North America. So um, the species that are most common around here in Massachusetts and on Cape Cod. And it has this cool thing uh, right in the front here. It shows you the parts of a standing bird, head feathers and markings, and the parts of a flying bird. So... When we're identifying birds, we're looking for what we call field marks. Uh, and, or birders sometimes call this, they describe it as the gist of a bird. So these are field marks here. They are parts of the bird, but they are field marks. And perhaps the easiest way to identify a bird is to look at its head. Look at the feathers on the head. Look at the shape of the bill, look at its eye color even, and look at the, the shape of the head in relationship to the body. The bill is often a big clue as to what species it, it, it is. So this is a uh, white-throated sparrow right here. Notice it's got a chunky bill for eating seeds, which is its primary food. It has this white stripe here, which we call an eyebrow. It's not truly an eyebrow, but that's what we call it. It has these stripes on its head, which we call crown stripes. It has this white throat patch here, which is characteristic of a white-throated sparrow. And it has a nice brown eye here. Above here, we can see all the parts of the bird, including its tail, it's various feathers in the wing, which are called primaries, secondaries, and tertials. Those are the feathers that are parts of the wing. Okay, and then, of course, the body, the breast, the sides of the bird, and the flanks. And then here, 
We have its leg, which we call its tarsus, and its toes. Over here, if you're trying to identify a bird in flight, you might refer to its wing. Here are the primaries, which are the outer feathers, and the secondaries, which are the inner feathers, and then also the underwing coverts, which are smaller feathers. And remember, one of the main characteristics of a bird is what? It has feathers. Does it have hair? No, it doesn't have hair. That's for mammals. Take a look at those feathers when you're outside. And bring a good field guide along with you. This is a nice one because it can fit in your pocket or in your Dennis Explorer's backpack. Let's go and take a walk outside and see what we can find. Wow, look at that. That's a gray catbird up in the tree. I hope you can hear that. Uh, catbird has a funny song and it has a cat-like call. This is a migratory bird that has just arrived back on Cape Cod within the past week or two. And they're very common in your yard. They'll even nest in ornamental shrubs in your yard because uh, they like shrubs. Oh, we have some other friends here. We got a blue jay family up in the tree here too. Well, I see one, two, three, four, five blue jays. Now, blue jays are pretty cool. They're very sociable birds. And sometimes the prior years, young, listen to them. They're loud. Wow, how annoying. <laughs> blue jays are funny because sometimes the prior year's brood will help raise the new brood of the year. And hopefully here we're going to get a shot of this gray capper. We'll see if we can... Our filmer can find it here. All right, having a little issue there. Let's take a walk. <laughs> no, yeah. Another thing you can do in your yard is you can put up a birdhouse. So, not all birds nest in birdhouses. The birds that nest in birdhouses are what we call cavity nesting species. So these are species that are adapted to living in small holes in trees or in stumps or uh, in the eaves of your house sometimes. And a birdhouse will attract these species. So if designed correctly, it will attract species such as black-capped chickadees, eastern tufted titmice, it might attract a house wren, or a Carolina wren, or if you're really lucky, it might even attract a bluebird. And it's very important to pay attention to the size of the hole when you're either purchasing or constructing a bird box or a bird a nest box. Uh, so inch and a quarter opening is perfect for those species. Uh, when you have larger holes, inch and a half, it's going to allow species like European starlings to use them, which are not from Cape Cod. They are, have been brought here a long time ago from Europe. Uh, they are not native and they are considered to be an invasive species, which means they uh, are aggressively utilizing the habitats uh, that native species would other like, otherwise be utilizing. And, wow, here, we're being treated to all kinds of bird song. In addition to our catbird that's singing again, we have a little sparrow in the tree here, chipping sparrow. And uh, let's go take a look at something else that we found in the yard here. Sometimes if you're very lucky, you can follow a bird around your yard and you might be able to find where they're nesting. 
So the thing to look for when you're watching birds is to see if it's carrying food or nesting material. If it's got food in its mouth, it could be either feeding its mate or it could be feeding its young. And if it has nesting material, it's going to bring it to the nest that it's building. We have an ornamental planting. It's called a Norfolk Island pine. It's not actually a pine tree. It's uh, not a native species, but we happen to notice something that was kind of cool here. Take a look at that. Wow. So that is a nest that's made out of grassy material. When you find a nest, you want to be very careful to not disturb the birds that are nesting there or to give away its location to a potential predator. So, if you find a nest, note where it is quickly and don't linger very long. Make sure that there are not crows around as you're observing the nest because crows will eat uh, the young of birds as well as eggs. In this case, uh, this nest is from last year, so it's been abandoned. When you find a nest, if you don't see the adults, and you're trying to figure out what it is, take a note of the color of the eggs, the type of nest material, write it all down, and go inside and go on the internet or check your field guides or even send uh, your teacher an email and perhaps they could help you identify it. In this case, uh, we found that this is a song sparrow nest, which is a very common uh, species in Dennis and all throughout Cape Cod and it's a resident species. So it's going to be nesting low in uh, bushes and nests made out of grass and leaves and such. So let's take another walk inside. Wow, I hope you're hearing this. We have a bunch of blue jays calling back and forth, that same blue jay family of four or five different birds. Let's also check out some of the native bushes that we have in the yard and trees. And this is a uh, arbor right or white cedar and a lot of birds like to nest in here. And this is a white pine tree. It has soft needles that are light green. Um, like uh, the pitch pine. The pitch pine is dark green, kind of uh, harsh, stabby needles. These are nice to your hand, and uh, they come in bundles of five. Okay, pitch pine comes in bundles of three, and it's it's nice. And it feels good on your skin, <laughs> and it smells nice too. And then back there, that's a pitch pine. Okay. Darker green needles in bundles of three. Then standing here, I just heard a uh, chickadee calling, and it's kind of amazing the number of species that you can find just in your own neighborhood. Well, I wanted to show you this. This is the number of species that I found in just spending a few minutes outside, and you can find all these in your neighborhoods too. A uh, feeder might help you find some of them. Um, and learning bird song, which we might talk about in our next video, is another great way to learn to identify birds. But I wanted to show you um, pictures of some of these birds so you can begin to get familiar with them. And I'm looking through our field guide here. Okay. Here's a common bird which is arriving back in our area. It's a brown-headed cowbird. That's an interesting bird. It nests in the nests of other species. So it, uh, it often is in flocks with uh, blackbirds and grackles, which are closely related species. And uh, they do this funny thing where they nest in the nests of other species and have them raise their young. Here's another closely related species to the cowbird. Common grackle, 
has a beautiful iridescent blue head, greenish and purple washes on the wings and on the flank. Uh, just a beautiful bird. Uh, you often find them with blackbirds. And um, they nest in trees um, all throughout our area. Very common. And they're loud, uh, notably. They have pretty harsh calls. Um, we're going to talk about calls and birdsong next time. And another species that you're going to be finding coming back into our area now is the beautiful Baltimore Oriole. And it's right up top here. And so here's the male, red and black and white wing bars. And the female is more drab. It looks like this here in flight. Um, or more like this bird here. Uh, yellowish, orange, greenish on the back and white right around the eyes. You notice all these birds have kind of pointy bills um, so those, that kind of bill is good for eating caterpillars and fruit. You might find if you put out oranges or grape jelly, you can attract Baltimore Orioles to your yard, which is a really fun bird to have in your yard. Uh, and they've just shown up in this past week. They migrate down to Central America in the winter. So they have quite an amazing migration to come back to Massachusetts. Here is the bird I saw in the beginning of our video here. Ruby-throated hummingbird. Beautiful hummingbird. Very small species. They weigh 0.1 ounces. Wow. Truly amazing. It would take 160 hummingbirds to get to a pound. Think about that. Wow. One pound. 160 hummingbirds. So we see them at flowers and we see them at hummingbird feeders. The male is the guy with the beautiful ruby red throat. The female, she does not have a red throat. She has a white throat. So um, they're starting to nest and they nest up in the trees. They have a nest that hangs down from the branches. Very small bird and flies very, very fast. Their wings are beating very, very fast. And, um, you can draw them in with hummingbird feeders. Um, and with hummingbird feeders, it's very important to not feed them red colored dye uh, because those red, those uh, sugar waters with the red dye in them, the red dye is bad for the birds. Um, it can be toxic in very large doses. What you should do is do something that's even cheaper, which is make your own sugar water one part sugar to four parts water, and you can make it on the stove or in the microwave, ask an adult to do it with you um, before you do that on your own. Um, it keeps well in the fridge. Make sure you use refined sugar. Brown sugar is not good, honey is not good, raw sugar is not good. What you want is white table sugar for making that uh, concoction for your hummingbirds. And there are a variety of DIY hummingbird uh, feeders that you can make at home and uh, I will share that link with you. So be well, enjoy the birds out there and uh, we'll talk to you next time.